a transcript of one of my conversations on his desk and um, so it makes you really worried about um, when you're having a conversation how do I know that the government is not listening to my conversation and what will be the penalty for uh, for my source you know it, 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 it's, it's really I think a very dangerous situation for a reporter to be in and I've had a, one former government official say I should buy a new phone every time I do an interview I don't know I, I, I it seems like a lot of trouble you know? but but on the other hand I, I need to protect my sources so I'm in a dilemma I don't know what to do about it it is a real problem I mean I, I don't even know sometimes when sending an email to somebody that you might want to interview, whether you are then um, damaging them in some way, just yeah. by just by associating our name as a reporter with somebody um, who whose boss may see it. I mean, at the CIA, for instance, they have everybody that you that you might um, contact there has to have an interview once a year on a polygraph themselves, where they're asked about whether they've talked to the news media. Right. And so, I mean, it's a, it's a virtual impossibility to have a conversation with somebody at the CIA that that their supervisors won't find out about. And you know, I mean, I literally have people, somebody just recently wanted to meet in a parking lot. It felt like like you know Woodward and Bernstein or yeah. something. Yeah. And um, so it it makes it hard. And I think. If you feel someone's listening to your conversations, it probably makes you edit out what you might want to say, too, doesn't it? And, and, you know, then there was a question of if I believe the government is monitoring my calls illegally, what do I do about it? And because if you actually sue them, then you draw all your sources into this suit and you expose them to that kind of...
undergraduate school. Yeah. <laughs> I agree that undergraduates should be studying something else. Well, I want to thank uh, Larry, Jane, and Jim, and thank you all for coming, and hope to see you next year. He was known for his domineering personality and arm-twisting tactics of powerful politicians known as the Johnson Treatment. Discover the political and personal side of our 36th president through secretly recorded phone conversations and family films shot by home movie enthusiast Lady Bird Johnson. Presidential Libraries, History Uncovered. Two hours live from the Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library in Austin, Texas. Tonight at 8 Eastern on C-SPAN, C-SPAN Radio, on XM Satellite Radio Channel 132 and online at cspan.org. For additional videos and other archival materials on the 12 presidents covered in this series, go to our website at cspan.org slash presidential libraries. And C-SPAN 3 History brings you more about the 36th president, including memories of the Lyndon Johnson White House, shared by former press secretaries Liz Carpenter and George Christian plus reporters who covered the Johnson administration, and historians, including Robert Dalek, author of several books about LBJ. This and more at 8 a.m. Eastern Time Saturday, and again Sunday night at 8, History on C-SPAN 3. Today's State Department briefing begins with a discussion of a letter sent by four House committee chairmen alleging widespread corruption in the Iraqi government. Other topics include the House Armenian Genocide Resolution and the conflict between Turkey and Kurdish rebels in northern Iraq. This is about 25 minutes. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday, TGIF. As you can see, my colleague, Mr. Gallegos, has, has started early since he's got his fishing vest on. I don't know whether that means the fly fishing's good this weekend or not, Gons, but hope you get there soon. I um, that's good. Uh, I don't have anything to start you guys out with, so what do you have for me? Today's letter from Chairman Waxman. Well, yes, it's, it's amazing. We've gotten another. Uh, I, I think the mail system is getting a little bit better between... Capitol Hill and the State Department as this one I am aware of and I know that we've received. Uh, this uh, letter is a follow-up to some hearings that occurred uh, about last week, last week concerning the issues of corruption um, in Iraq. Um, let me just say that, first of all, nowhere in that letter does it say that the State Department hasn't provided all the information that the committees actually asked for. Uh, once again, and we've discussed this before, uh, there are questions raised about whether information that is currently classified should not be classified and what kind of discussion <clears throat> should be had about classified information. Um, these are normal kinds of procedures that we have for ensuring that the handling of sensitive information, of classified information, is treated appropriately. We, of course, have made people available and made information available uh, to the committee on these subjects. And certainly we'll take a look at the letter and see if uh, there is anything more that we can provide or anything we might be able to offer by way of additional unclassified um, assessments or information related to corruption in Iraq. But I think the one thing that is clear and that I certainly don't think is, uh, is an issue even in the letter, is the idea that the information that they've asked for, they have received. Well, I mean, I, I take issue with, with, with your characterization of what, what's in and isn't in the letter. I mean, it, 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 it includes right up at the top that uh, question of whether the State Department has, has prevented um, its employees from testifying, refused to testify is, is, is the word, and it says the State Department has taken other steps to suppress information about the extent of corruption within the Maliki government. 
Well, the, that reference is to the fact that we don't wish to have discussions of classified information take place in unclassified settings. Um, I don't see anything in there that says that documents that were requested weren't received or that officials that were requested did not, in fact, go and testify. I yeah. to speak uh, quite extensively about the retroactive, retroactive classification of documents and saying that, you know, this is basically a sort of a trick of you to suppress information. Um, I wonder whether you had any comment on the retroactive classification. Well, I first of all would say that if the committee was provided information, then it's hard to say how that information was being suppressed. Um, but <clears throat> again, we covered this particular subject before the last hearing. Um, we think it's important that we protect the names of individuals who have provided us information. We think it's important to protect the integrity of any ongoing Iraqi investigations that may take that are taking place on this issue. We think it's important that we be able to continue to work successfully with the Iraqi government on a broad range of issues, including the very fundamental and important issue of anti-corruption. But, you know, there seems to be <clears throat> some kind of assertion being made here that the State Department doesn't acknowledge corruption in Iraq or doesn't acknowledge that it's a problem. Um, more important than what we acknowledge is what Prime Minister Maliki and his government acknowledge. They acknowledge that corruption is a serious issue for their country. They acknowledge it not only in a rhetorical sense, but in the actions they've taken on the ground. And that includes establishing various kinds of oversight bodies. That includes working with us to try and deal with what is a problem not only in Iraq, but in many countries throughout the world. So certainly, um, I don't think anyone could argue that the State Department or the U.S. government or the Iraqi government is trying to deny that corruption is a serious problem and is one that needs to be addressed. And that's why we've been working, as has been acknowledged by the Special Inspector General for Iraq and others, with the Iraqi government on a program to try and deal with uh, some of these issues. What we don't think is appropriate and never have is the idea of taking information that could potentially make it harder for us to achieve those objectives or could potentially endanger the safety of some of the individuals involved and discuss that in an unclassified setting. But again, if you provide information and do so appropriately following the guidelines that you have, um, for handling information. It's hard, I think, to argue that there's any attempt to hide or suppress information here. But what they're saying is that you're misusing the classification procedures and that you're just kind of willy-nilly going back and classifying stuff that doesn't suit your political intentions. Well, uh, again, I, I think that our intention is to have a, a successful and effective effort against corruption in partnership with the Iraqi government. And we certainly want to be able to talk about that and discuss it in all appropriate ways with the members of Congress who are interested. That is certainly their right. It, we want to make sure that there is a clear understanding about this. But again, I don't think there is anything unusual about officials saying that we'd like to discuss classified information and confidential information in a closed door session. Um, there certainly, as I think any of you could find looking at your reporting um, over the years, ample public discussion of this, of this issue and ample public discussion by U.S. officials of it, including my statement here. Yeah, same. Um, oh, um, sorry, same thing? Well, Go ahead. Uh, Either way. It's the same. Di different issues, same congressman. Do you have the, sure. the same? Yeah. Um, but you, mean you said it was important to protect names and, and of the people and the investigations and, mm -hmm. and so forth. But then how do you explain why you would make it public in the first place if, if it was um, an issue of, of endangerment and protection and then go back and, and, and classify now, it? I, look, what, I, what was the I process will, of I that? Will, I, I'd refer you back to what I said on this issue couple of weeks ago when this came up. Um, there were some documents produced by some contractors for the State Department intended for internal deliberations within the embassy on how to continue to manage and adapt our, um, our anti-corruption efforts with the Iraqis. Um, there was never a report. There was never any document 
that was released formally or informally. Um, you know, some of these internal documents were leaked were leaked to a variety of different officials. That doesn't mean that they should be um, that their basic confidential nature ought to change because they got leaked. So you've given every, every, every are you saying that every single document that has been requested by Waxman and his committee has been delivered to you or not? My understanding is that all of the information that's been requested, including all the documents that have been requested, were provided to the committee. And I believe were provided to the committee before the hearing took place last week. Um, it's my understanding, based on this letter and what our officials tell me, that the contention here is simply over the fact that some of that information is classified, and we have chosen to discuss that information in a classified setting. Sue? Well, oh, sorry, back to you. You're still on this. Okay. Well, a week ago, um, Chairman Waxman um, asked you to provide some information um, in the Blackwater uh, issue on uh, uh, Moonen, the, um, the guard in the uh, uh, Christmas Eve shooting uh, by today. Um, and I wondered whether that information has been provided um, and uh, whether it will be released I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I know people were working on that. I'm not sure whether it's all been provided or partly been provided. I, I can check for you if you want. So. Just one other thing. In this letter, which was actually signed by three other Democratic mm -hmm. congressmen, all chairs of their various committees, <coughs> no, and not just Waxman, mm -hmm. um, they say that they believe that endemic corruption in Iraq may be fueling the insurgency, endangering troops, and undermining the chance for chances for success. Would you agree with that statement? Well, I think I'm not sure whether they were that was their statement or whether they were referring to something a previous witness had said. Um, what I can tell you, Sue, is that corruption is a serious problem in Iraq. It's a serious problem in many countries. The Prime Minister and the government of Iraq recognize it as a serious problem. We do as well. And we are working with them in a number of, way, in a number of ways to ensure that corruption doesn't become a bigger issue and that, in fact, we take actions to correct it. Um, certainly, when you look at the nature of uh, the issues that are here, it's very clear. It's very clear that you know you do need to have the development of those kinds of institutions that can best serve the interests of the Iraqi people. One of the things that's critical for any society, developing, developed, or otherwise, is that it has institutions that function and that function in a transparent way, and that there are mechanisms in place to ensure that and to deal with those who walk outside the lines and who do engage in corrupt practices. Um, that is something that the Iraqis are working on and need to continue to work on in order to ensure that their people can be guaranteed, that their institutions are working effectively for them and providing services adequately as well. And that's a key priority for the U.S. government. It's a key priority for the Iraqi government. Just one more thing. Sure. Um, on September 25th, they say that the uh, State Department issued an order ordering its officials not to answer sort of broad questions in an open setting that ask questions mm -hmm. about corruption, Iraqi governance in general. Was this order issued on September the 25th and Waxman plans to introduce a resolution on Monday asking for it to be rescinded? Mm -hmm. uh, Sue, there's no such directive. Um, my understanding is that two working level officials um, were asked uh, not to provide broad policy assessments and that our po policy officials ought to do that. Um, that's hardly a directive for people not to comment on corruption. Um, again, uh, a broad assessment might be me standing here saying corruption is a serious problem in Iraq and it's a serious problem that the United States and the Iraqi government intend to work on together and have been working on together. I don't think, again, we're trying to uh, hide any basic facts. I think it would be pretty obvious based on the public statements, again, of the Prime Minister and other Iraqi officials that this is an issue. The whole reason why we have a anti-corruption program that, again, has been discussed and reported on in any number of places is because we acknowledge that this is an issue and it's an important issue for both us and the Iraqis. So in your view, is it then pointless for him to put out a resolution asking for you to rescind it when it wasn't there in the first place? 
Look, Sue, uh, you know, I'll leave it up to the individual uh, members of Congress to make their decisions on what they want to do. I'm just trying to provide you with what the facts are here. Um, certainly, we will make every effort to respond appropriately to the, any requests, current or future, that are made on this or other subjects uh, by the Hill. Uh, again, uh, I think we'll take a, a look once more at this issue and see if there is any more information that could be provided in a unclassified manner or an unclassified setting, maybe through redacting documents or doing some other kind, kinds of things. But again, what we want to make sure that we do is preserve our ability to help the Iraqis effectively deal with corruption. And we also want to make sure that we don't put forward any information in public that might either make it harder for that job to get done or potentially endanger the safety of some of the individuals involved. Michelle? Change of subject. Uh, okay. PKK has issued a, a statement today that, uh, saying that they are moving back into Turkey from northern Iraq and that they will target Turkey, uh, Turkey's ruling uh, party, AK, and main opposition, CHP. Do you have any reaction on that? I uh, haven't seen it, Michelle, but look, the PKK is a terrorist organization, and the PKK needs to be put out of business. Um, the United States is going to work with the government of Turkey and going to work with the government of Iraq to make sure that we do everything we can to prevent them from engaging in violent acts against the people of Turkey, and I expect that we'll be continuing to do so over time. So uh, I I unfortunately don't think it's surprising to see threats um, emanating from this terrorist organization, but I don't think that's going to stop us from working and working effectively with the Turkish government and the other parties involved to deal with it. Mr. Lambros, something tells me you're on the same subject. Oh, yes, to be more visible. <laughs> Mr. Chase on Turkey, a bunch of reports in international media and the press are insisting over and over since yesterday that the whole issue of the Armenian Resolution is a big game between the executive branch of your government and the Congress for geopolitical reasons against the territorial integrity of Turkey from the northern Iraq area. How do you respond to those criticisms? Well, I'm not sure uh, who's saying that, Mr. Lambros, but look, we're, we've been very clear um, on this subject. We, we, the executive branch, we, the administration, have opposed this resolution. We've done so publicly and actively. Uh, we regret that the resolution, in fact, was passed by the committee. And you've heard from us and from the White House that we are committing ourselves to working with Congress on this again to try and ensure that that resolution, in fact, is defeated when it comes to the floor. Secretary Rice, as I mentioned earlier this morning to some of you, had conversations uh, with a number of Turkish officials at the highest levels to make sure that she personally was able to convey our regret that this resolution had passed the committee and our desire to continue to work to oppose it. Certainly, I am not aware of anyone in the administration or in Congress or anywhere in the U.S. government that uh, believes that this resolution should have any impact or is intended to have any in impact on the territorial integrity of Turkey or any other country. Did the Secretary Rice spoke to Turkish Foreign Minister Ali Babacan, to the Turkish President Abdullah Gül and to the Turkish Prime Minister Recep Ertogan? Uh, she did make a call to uh, Foreign Minister Babakan, and she also requested the opportunity to speak and was granted the opportunity to speak with both the President and Prime Minister. And that's all? The other uh, well, again, I, I talked about this this morning, but um, she conveyed our, conveyed our views on this. Uh, again, I think I'll let the, the Turkish government speak to their own um, understand, understanding of this, but it was a, a um, positive discussion. I think they understand that we are making the efforts that we can to convince Congress that this is not an appropriate step and that this resolution should uh, should not be approved. In terms in terms of though, I, I'd leave it to them though in terms of how they, they receive that message or how they, they would interpret or how they feel. Since about your request is pending on since yesterday to speak to Mr. Erdogan, to Mr. Jul, any response from Ankara to this effect? 
Well, again, she did speak with both the prime minister and the president yesterday in addition to the foreign minister. So she has had conversations with all three of them. Zane. Are there any additional phone calls beyond what you told us this morning uh, from uh, Nick Burns to, to the Turks or, uh, or otherwise uh, from this building? No, not, not that I'm aware of. Again, I, the secretary spoke with, yeah. with her um, counterpart as well as with the prime minister and president yesterday. Nick did speak again with the Turkish ambassador yesterday afternoon just to clarify, clarify his situation and status. As I told you this morning, our understanding from him is that he has not been withdrawn or recalled, but has been asked to come back home for a brief period of time for consultations. Uh, Nick stressed in his conversation with him his desire to continue to work with the ambassador and to uh, continue to be a, a good interlocutor for him, uh, particularly as we move forward on this issue, as well as on the broader range of issues on which we work with Turkey. I, I would hope that people would not lose sight in all of this discussion about this resolution. The fact that the U.S. and Turkey have a broad range of common interests, whether that's in fighting the PKK or whether that's in cooperating more broadly on counterterrorism issues, whether that's supporting the efforts of the Iraqi government to stabilize the country. And as you know, the Turkish government has generously offered to host the next round of the neighbors, con neighbors conference to try and coordinate those actions. Turkey, of course, is also a longstanding friend and NATO ally with the United States. Uh, their troops have participated in operations in Afghanistan and in other peacekeeping operations that uh, have been NATO-led. And certainly, we would expect and hope that despite the very strong feelings on this issue, that we would be able to continue to have that kind of good, allied, friendly relations between our countries. Yeah. yeah. Can we think of any other examples of, of a country with that kind of close and friendly relationship and, and, or, or a NATO member recalling its ambassador with, uh, or calling home its ambassador for consultation? Uh, I think you'd have to check with any of the 20, 25 NATO allies on that, but uh, I would think that it would be a relatively common occurrence for ambassadors to go back home for consultations. Uh, I'm not trying to tell you that the passage of this resolution by the committee isn't the proximate reason for that. What I'm trying to emphasize is in, in the parlance of this building and for those who spend their time dealing with diplomacy, there's a rather strong difference between being invited back home for consultations versus being withdrawn versus being recalled. Well, yes, but I, but I mean, it still is an unusual <coughs> occurrence. Even uh, it, I mean, I, I I can't think of another example, and I'm just wondering if well, you can. Well, well, um, let's put it this way: I can think of many examples on a regular basis in which we ask our ambassadors to come home for consultation. Sometimes that's simply because they haven't been back in a year, and we want to make sure we've talked to them. Sometimes it's related to a specific event that's occurred. Um, I would be, uh, I'll let the Turkish government speak to how they want to categorize this or qualify, or qualify this. Um, I'm not trying to tell you that they do not, they have not had a strong reaction to the passage of this resolution. You've heard statements from the president and prime minister and others about that. Um, all I'm, try all I'm trying to say is, at least for those of us in this building, uh, a recall or a withdrawal of ambassador implies some change in the diplomatic relations or the status of diplomatic relations between the two countries. And that, in fact, is not the case, at least as we understand it from the ambassador. Yeah, try. Uh, uh, Turkish officials uh, dealing with additional assistance that the United States can make in the, uh, in the terrorism fight for Turkey? Well, look, I think it's very important that we all do everything we can to deal with the problem that's posed by the PKK. Um, our desire to do that and our desire to work with the Turks and the Iraqis on this hasn't changed, and we're going to continue to do so. I don't think that there is any higher priority for us in terms of our working with both those countries together than to deal with this problem. We recognize it's a very serious issue, and we've 
put a good deal of effort into it, and we're going to continue to do so. But, but Turkey doesn't feel as though the U.S. has treated it as a high enough priority and, and has been the source of the tensions between, you know, the, the two countries in, in, in recent weeks and months. And I mean, w when you're providing, when you talk of providing more assistance or cooperating with them, does that will would that translate into destroying more bases? Um, of uh, the PKK in, in northern Iraq I, or handing I, I over think some of I'll, I think I'll let the um, Iraq, Iraqi army and MNFI and the Turkish general staff talk about you know, military operations. Did you give them any assurances that that would be something that... that Again, I, I, I think these, these you're operating under a false premise, though, because your premise is that we aren't and haven't been dedicated to taking strong That's action. The 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 from the Turkish point of view. Well, again, I, I think we've made clear over time our views on this. Uh, we have uh, said and offered any number of opportunities where we can and will cooperate. We have established a variety of means of communication. We've been working cooperatively on the ground between the military forces of the country, other countries. We've been operating at the diplomatic level, including at, at high levels, both through regular channels as well as uh, Separate, one, separate ones that have designed specifically to deal with this issue. So I'd simply just uh, take issue with the idea that we aren't concerned or haven't been. And certainly we want to do everything we can. And if the Turkish government or the Iraqi government or anyone else involved in this process has additional ideas on how we can make this more effective, we certainly want to hear about them and certainly want to be able to discuss them and uh, and work together on this. Because again, this isn't a Turkish issue, it's not an Iraqi issue, it's not a U.S. issue. It's one where all three of us are engaged and involved. And we are just as interested as the government of Turkey or the government of Iraq in seeing that this terrorist group does not pose a threat to innocent people anywhere. Can you give any examples of action that has been taken by the U.S. against the PKK? Look, if you want to do a blow-by-blow blow of military actions in northern Iraq against the PKK, my friends at MNFI can help you. Again, you've got uh, a wide range of cooperation between both on-the-ground on military forces. You've had special envoys working and dealing on this issue, and you've had, had high-level diplomatic conversations on it. I think if you talk with uh, those on the ground in northern Iraq, they can tell you about some of the specific raids, arrests, um, and other activities that have been designed to disrupt and affect PKK operations there. Uh, obviously, it's still a problem. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here talking about it now. And that means we all have to continue to work on it and probably have to see what other means we can come up with to deal with it. But again, I, I, take content, I just strongly contend the fact or contest the fact that we are somehow haven't been serious about this or haven't been engaged in it, because we really have. Has the U.S. been involved in arrests of PKK, suspected PKK members? Where are those stars on my shoulder? I think you can talk to the U.S. military in Iraq about specific operations they may or may not Surely have been involved in. And that would have filtered to the State Department. Again, I will let the Pentagon and the military on the ground talk to you about specific actions. I, I think the Iraqis have spoken to this. I believe Major General Bergner has spoken to it in a number of his briefings. I simply don't have details on the specifics of that, and I don't think my friends at the Pentagon would be appreciative of me trying to step into their turf on it. But I'm sure your correspondents over there can ask them about this, and they'll be happy to tell you about it. Now, Army Colonel J.B. Burton, commander of the 2nd Brigade Combat Team, 1st Infantry Division, briefs reporters from Iraq on the ongoing security operations there. Well, good morning and welcome, and uh, good afternoon to uh, Colonel Burton. It's, this is Brian Whitman at the Pentagon. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us again. Uh, in this second time back to the Pentagon Press Corps here. Uh, this is uh, Colonel J.B. Burton, the commander of 2nd Brigade First, Second Brigade Combat Team, 1st Infantry Division. Uh, he assumed command of uh, the Dagger Brigade back in June of 2005. And today he is uh, speaking to us from Baghdad. And we'll give you a brief um, operational update uh, and assessment in terms of what his unit's been doing, and then we'll take your questions. So, Colonel, uh, again, thank you for coming back and sharing a second time with us what you're doing. 
Great. Well, uh, good morning, and thanks for this opportunity to talk with you all. As said, I'm J.B. Burton of the 2nd Brigade Combat Team, 1st Infantry Division, also known as the Dagger Brigade Combat Team. And we assumed responsibility for coalition forces in northwest Baghdad in November of last year, and I feel it's important to update you on some of the many changes since then, and then entertain any questions that you might have. Since our deployment from Schweinfurt, Germany last year, we dispatched our three organic maneuver task forces and our field artillery battalion to other brigade combat teams, and then subsequently integrated and employed five robust maneuver task forces as part of our formation here. Three of those task forces are from the surge, which began arriving in January, providing us increased combat power and capabilities to get at our mission. We retain our highly capable combat engineer battalion, forward support battalion, five separate companies, and we've established a provisional task force to assist in the formal integration and synchronization of coalition and Iraqi security force efforts here. Each of those formations provide critical enablers on the streets and inside the neighborhoods of northwest Baghdad and help to make a positive difference daily. Our soldiers, in conjunction with our Iraqi security force partners, have set the conditions for increased positive growth here. We have integrated and employed an embedded provincial reconstruction team, which delivers tremendous capability to help us understand and affect reconstruction and reconciliation efforts. They provide us the savvy necessary to understand and integrate resources from various joint and interagency actors to assist us in achieving our objectives. We are partnered with 10 Iraqi Army battalions and two national police battalions deployed across the Kadamiya and the Mansour security districts. Both of these districts are commanded by highly competent, patriotic Iraqi Brigadier Generals who consistently demonstrate their unbreakable will to deliver security, reconciliation, and reconstruction to Northwest Baghdad. Collectively, we are responsible for a heavily urbanized area of 93 square kilometers or 36 square miles and more than 1 million people. Our area is principally Shia in the northeast and north, Sunni in the south and west, and somewhat mixed in the east. These simple demographics further define the fault lines where sectarian contests reached their peak in January, with Al-Qaeda and their surrogates fighting to bring terror and destruction to Baghdad from the west, and where Shia extremists sought to reduce Sunni population centers and Al-Qaeda sanctuaries through extrajudicial killings and large-scale displacements from the north in places like Korea. Those original fault lines now largely define the areas where the government of Iraq has or has not been able to deliver services and sustain reconstruction efforts. North and east of these fault lines, in places like Kadamiya, government-provided services and reconstruction efforts are generally working pretty well. To the south and southwest, in places like Ghazalia and Amaria, the government has yet to deliver a measured increase in essential services. So reconstruction in these areas is provided largely through coalition force and other contracts. There does remain a challenge for the government to deliver certain essential services, such as fuel and electricity, into the city, regardless of which side of the fault lines you fall on. All of this defines our environment, and thus our approach here. When initially analyzing our area, we recognized the majority of the population was largely secular, moderate, and a cycle of violence was being delivered by extremists and criminals. The majority of the citizens were tired of the violence and eager to get about the task of reconstruction. So in order to stop the cycle of violence, we set about to defeat sectarian expansion conducted by Shia extremists while simultaneously defeating al-Qaeda and denying their access to the population. In short, we had to get out into the city, live among the citizens, fight alongside the Iraqis, and deny insurgents, criminals, and extremists free access to the population. The Baghdad security plan, along with a troop surge, allowed us to do just that, thus increasing our ability to affect the communities and combine our efforts with those of our Iraqi partners. We have established 14 joint security stations inside the neighborhoods where our soldiers live, plan, and work alongside the Iraqi security forces day in and day out. We have created safe neighborhoods to disrupt and ultimately deny extremists and criminals free access to the population. These safe neighborhoods have controlled entry and exit points manned 24 hours a day by Iraqi security forces to deny extremists and criminals free access. We have positioned JSSs inside these neighborhoods, providing our soldiers, the Iraqi security forces, and local citizens continuous access to each other so that we can collectively solve the problems of the communities from a common perspective. Further, we are focused on extending the reach of the government by providing businesses access to financial capital 
and through the development of public work substations that employ locals in local areas to deliver essential services within their capacity. Our embedded reconstruction team and Joint Project Management Office are helping us achieve these effects. The combined effects of partnered operations to defeat extremists and sectarian expansion, the establishment of joint security stations and a coordinated safe neighborhood effort has provided a window of opportunity for local businesses to open and where local citizens have come forward as volunteers committed to the security and reconstruction of their local areas. This is happening on both sides of the fault lines. These volunteers are actively providing security in partnership with our combined forces and concurrently increasing the citizens' confidence in the Iraqi security forces as a whole. Our Iraqi partners are working closely with us to recruit, hire, and then transition these volunteers into the Iraqi security force formations. To date, we have a total of 1,772 volunteers and recruits who are fully screened and ready to attend academy for integration into the Iraqi security forces, with 500 scheduled to attend academy this month. We have begun to see an increasing number of former Iraqi army officers coming forward to rejoin the security forces of their nation, and we are working closely with our Iraqi security force partners on this issue. These are positive indicators, and we continue to welcome anyone who is willing to work alongside our combined forces to secure the population and create increased opportunities for the citizens. The improvements in the security situation in northwest Baghdad can be measured by an 85% reduction in violence since May of this year. Of our 95 mahalas or neighborhoods, 58 of them are now considered under control. 33 remain in a clearing status with violence continuing to go down, and 4 remain in a disrupt status. Here are some figures. Murders are down from a peak of over 161 reported murders per week a year ago to less than 5 per week now and our continued efforts to defeat sectarian expansion continue to drive these numbers down. IED and small arms attacks are down from a peak of 50 per week in June to less than five per week since the end of August. And vehicle-borne IED attacks are down nearly 85% due to our combined efforts to defeat the CARC, VBIED, and IED networks, which has had a tremendous impact on insurgents' ability to construct and employ those types of weapons effectively. While our enemy continues to seek ways to attack us, he is increasingly ineffective due to disrupted supply and financial networks and continuous loss of sanctuary and freedom of movement. Iraqi confidence in security is evidenced by an increased number of walk-ins, call-ins, and email tips to our joint security stations. This, evidence is, this confidence is further evidenced by the return of businesses to previously empty storefronts and market areas, increased numbers of kids in the parks and at schools, and by the increased number of locals engaged in reconstruction and revitalization of their neighborhoods. With our Iraqi partners, we are fully engaged and committed to the security of the Iraqi people and to the reconstruction of Northwest Baghdad. Now, this mission is far from over, and there's still a lot of work to be done, but we're getting after that every day. Now, with that, I'll be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Well, thank you. We do have a few. Uh, let's start with uh, Kristen. So this is Kristen Roberts with Reuters. There's been some criticism of the statistics on a reduction in violence um, in Iraq and in your area as a whole. Um, particularly, there's been the criticism that, that the number showing sectarian violence has declined is due to the fact, due to the massive displacement of people, so that areas that were once Shia no longer are, and that's why there's been a reduction in violence. Can you speak to that criticism? You know, that's, that's a great question, and I do appreciate that, because I've, I've asked my staff those questions specifically. Now, remember, when I came in here in November, sectarian violence was, uh, was in fact, happening. We saw a peak in sectarian violence and expansion starting in, uh, again in January. By that time, we had already integrated our Baghdad security plan inside the Dagger Brigade to focus on the defeat of sectarian expansion across the zone. Now, you might say, you might be led to believe that because consolidation of the population centers had happened, that sectarian violence is then on the downturn. What I would offer is that we continue to see attempts at sectarian expansion from the north and northeast of our areas, and we're focused very heavily on the defeat of those uh, extrajudicial and, uh, and uh, murder squads that are projecting themselves from the north and northeast of our area. So the motivation is still out there for criminal enterprises and uh, financially motivated individuals to prosecute a sectarian cleansing campaign in northwest Baghdad. 
So we are focused very heavily on the defeat of those death squads and the destruction of their infrastructure so that they no longer threaten the population in uh, northwest Baghdad. But have you seen a major change in the makeup of the neighborhoods in your area? I mean, are areas that when you entered last November, when, areas that were Shia, are they still Shia? And areas that were Sunni, are they still Sunni? Predominantly they are. However, given the increased security situation in our areas, we have seen a return of displaced citizens back into portions of our uh, area of responsibility. These aren't in huge numbers by any means. And when people started returning to the neighborhoods, the government of Iraq identified a challenge because displaced people had been had arrived in neighborhoods after they had been pushed out from neighborhoods from other parts of the country and other parts of the city. Well, people trying to move back into the neighborhoods now found people in their houses. So the government of Iraq is developing a program to help get these people resettled. We have seen, though, people moving back into these neighborhoods of both sects, both Shia and Sunni, who are now actively involved in these communities where security is, has increased and the uh, confidence in the security and improvement of the overall environment is um, understood by the citizens. So I believe that we have defeated, for law, in the large part, sectarian expansion through the commitment of Iraqi security forces and coalition force efforts. We do see displaced citizens moving back into their homes uh, that they had left previously. These are all good news signs to us as we look towards the government of Iraq to develop policies to help us integrate these people back into their neighborhoods. Colonel, this is Joe Tabet with Al Hura. Uh, talking on the sectarian violence, what could you tell us about the Jaish al Mahdi, especially in your area of responsibility in the north and the northeast of your area? What about its role, its activity right now? Okay, the, um, there's a lot of groups operating out of the northern and northeastern portion of our area of responsibility that operate under the banner of Jaysh al-Mahdi, whether legitimately or illegitimately. Uh, what we do is we focus instead of on an organization on the criminal actors within those organizations. Jaysh al-Mahdi, in large part, we believe has responded to the call for cessation of hostilities by McDonald al-Sadr. And so we welcome that. We also understand, though, that there are rogue actors out there where people that were interested in, uh, ex in expanding and supporting a cause to defeat al-Qaeda have transitioned their ideas to criminally and financially motivated enterprises, and they have now become uh, rogue elements. They're not responsive to much of anybody. They still operate uh, under the banner of Jaysh al-Mahdi. Do not believe that Jaysh al-Mahdi is solely responsible for their actions, but they do help us to understand now who is responsive to and who is not responsive to McDada al-Sadr and some of the other leaders from the office of the martyr Sadr. Excuse me, just to follow up, do you have any information about Muqtada al-Sadr? Where is he right now? I have no information on where McDada al-Sadr is. Go ahead. Carl, it's uh, Louis Martinez with ABC News. Uh, a question about contractors operating in your area. Um, there is, in light of the recent events with the Blackwater shootings in Isser Square, uh, has there been more interaction and more oversight on, on, on your part with regards to how they operate in your sector? Well, we have, uh, let me make it perfectly clear, we have contractors operating all over the place. We have contractors that are providing security to government officials. We have contractors that are fixing my digital communication systems. And we have contractors helping to sustain my route clearance equipment. All of these people play a vital role. The uh, challenge that we run into with anybody, contractor or not, is when they transit our areas of responsibility without proper coordination. I have, uh, I have been interviewed and I have made my position known about my increased desire to have increased coordination with these formations as they move through our area so that I can respond to any incidents that they may become involved in. And I believe that uh, our message has been well received. If I could follow up uh, on another point, um, has 
there been a transit of weapons to insurgents in your area, perchance uh, through the use of some of these uh, contractors that maybe belong, that are protecting uh, Iraqi government convoys, um, or use of, hot, let's say, ambulances or something like that? Is that something that you guys are seeing in your sector? Well, you know what? We have, in fact, uncovered a uh, ambulance in the northern portion of our sector that was, trans that was uh, transporting weapons in the city. We make it a habit to, uh, to oversee the checkpoints throughout the city, to take the opportunity to check any vehicles and any patrols that aren't part of our formation uh, to ensure that they are in compliance with the rules. And we would find people that are not in compliance with the rules. We take the appropriate actions. Does that, does, ahead, I'm sorry, Ian. Yeah, does that include Iraqi government uh, convoys that are protected by security contractors that in the past may have been uh, granted transit through checkpoints? And have, have your checkpoint, has your checkpoint visibility been increased to counter that? Listen, we have uh, operations going on inside of Baghdad that focus on anybody transiting our area that we may be suspicious about their activities. Certainly, I don't want to divulge all the uh, specifics of that, but if I've got concerns about a certain party or organization that may be involved in the transport of illegal weapons or illegal personnel or involved in illegal activities, I'll let that be known to my higher headquarters, and then I develop programs to intercept and defeat those, those operations. Colonel Bill McMichael of the Military Times Newspapers. Uh, when you briefed us in March, you talked about uh, IEDs and VBIDs and, um, and EFPs that have been found in your area, both discovered and uh, had been exploded. And I wanted to kind of update that a little bit, or get you to update that if you could. And um, Mark, you told us that you discovered uh, that 89 uh, IEDs have been detonated in January, and that number was down as of March 16th to 21. Uh, and you just you had uh, also discovered 36 uh, IEDs in January. That was down to uh, 10 through half of March. EFPs, you had discovered 12 in January. That was down to three in March. And I wonder if you could please give us just a, a sense, specifically in those terms, to compare, to compare uh, what you're finding now and what's been what's what you've encountered now. Well, I will. The uh, first off. In the uh, Sunni areas, we had seen, we saw a transition from largely military-grade munitions to what we termed homemade explosives uh, that the insurgents were using to build bombs, some of them very effective and large bombs, to target and uh, kill our soldiers. Now, some of them were effective. Uh, we have found uh, even more. But in, on the average, uh, September was our monthly low with uh, less than one IED found on, on a daily basis uh, throughout the entire month of September. So we've continued to see a constant downturn in, uh, in IEDs in the Sunni, uh, Al-Qaeda, and their surrogates associated areas. Up where we were originally seeing explosive form penetrators, we have made a robust effort to target the cells associated with the import and employment of those, uh, those weapon systems. And we have seen a drastic reduction in their employment across the zone. Uh, very rarely, do we uh, find the, uh, the, an effective EFP within our principal, um, our former historical EFP hotspots, given the increased participation of local nationals in helping us to find these weapons, the increased responsiveness of the Iraqi security forces to defeat these cells, and the increased effectiveness of our targeting operations to de defeat the entire network that, pr that tries to get far left of the explosion before it hits our forces. So we have seen a, a dramatic uh, decrease in IEDs uh, of both types, well, of all three types, military-grade munitions, homemade explosives, and explosive form penetrators across the zone. Even more importantly, what I would tell you is that we're starting to see the effects of our disruption efforts and our targeting efforts on the ability of the enemy to employ IEDs effectively a continued downturn in the reduction of effectiveness in the employment of both explosive form penetrators and IEDs of homemade explosive or military grade forms across our area of responsibility. And I believe this is because we have torn the networks apart. We have removed their experts and we've put them in prison. And we have them in such a uh, state of disruption that they are no longer able to well organize themselves to get ahead of us in our reconnaissance and direct action efforts.
Could you give us some? Uh, could you give us any uh, numbers to associate with the uh, the EFPs that you're finding? Well, I can. I'll tell you that we're finding a one to two EFPs across the zone generally per month. Uh, we have had a few detonate outside of our area of responsibility in the uh, last uh, in the last week or so. We had seen an increase of uh, EF, well, not an increase, but about two a week in the um, months of August and September. But we were finding them before they were detonating on our soldiers, and that is a, that is a very positive trend. So we are not seeing the uh, great wealth of explosive form penetrators. Uh, munitions across our zone of action any longer. What we did find, we started finding down in the uh, the Sunni areas was an increased uh, employment of uh, very large IEDs designed to create massive casualties. And through the integration of local nationals and local national trip tips, we've been able to pull those weapons off the battlefield effectively. Just the other night, in the former uh, stated uh, capital of the Islamic State of Iraq, in the uh, actual Hay of Amaria, we removed a very large quantity of these weapons from the battlefield along with the folks that put them there. And we're real proud to know that we have removed that asset from our enemy's hands. Let me just follow up with the IEDs, uh, Colonel. You said that you're finding um, uh, less than one IED daily, at least in the Sunni areas uh, currently, and that would be roughly 30 a month. That's roughly what you were finding in January in your area. Um, can you give us? A, can you contrast that with the um, number of that are IEDs that are being detonated in your area on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis? There were you reported 89 detonations a month, or for the month of January. Yeah, right now in the uh, in the uh, in the month of September. There was a total of 19 IEDs found across the entire zone. That's why I'm saying it's less than one per day because the math doesn't add up to 30. So we found 19 in the month of September, and that has been a part of this continuous downturn in IEDs uh, from across the zone. Uh, and in the month of September, in terms of detonations, we, uh, we had a total of 21 detonations in the month of September, and most of those were largely ineffective against our soldiers. We suffered some damage to some vehicles, mainly uh, flattened tires and some, uh, some damage to the armor. But our soldiers are walking away from these uh, most of the time in very good shape. Sergeant Kristen Roberts again. As, as American troop levels start to decline to pre-surge levels very gradually over the next few months, do you think you're going to be able to hold on to these gains that you're citing for us? But that, that is a great, great question. And here's what we're doing. Uh, in, the, in the entire zone, as we continue to work with local nationals that are involved and interested in providing security, we're creating more and more capacity on the part of the Iraqi security forces. I fully understand that at some point I've got to transition battle space responsibilities to the local nationals. So our partnership at, at the joint security sites, partnered training, with our Iraqi security force partners and formal integration of these volunteers serves to create capacity in terms of security forces that can assist us in retaining control of areas that we have already achieved control in. That allows us to take available forces and then relocate them to areas where we might need, where we don't have enough uh, volunteer security forces and where we might need to have an increased coalition force present. That informs us of how we cycle these volunteers through academy and how we cycle uh, these volunteers into the Iraqi security forces so that we increase capability at the local level to allow the coalition force commanders and the Iraqi security force commanders to reallocate forces in space to sustain the effort to secure the population of northwest Baghdad. Do I think, it, do I think we can sustain it? I do. It will take, though, a continued investment on the part of the coalition forces and the government of Iraq to identify, integrate these, uh, these great volunteers into legitimate Iraqi security forces and then employ them effectively and non-sectarianly uh, against criminals, insurgents, and terrorists across the zone. 
you said were now under control out of the 95 in your area. Are those, be, are those, are the Iraqi security forces playing the lead role in controlling those areas? You know, the Iraqi security forces, that, that's, the Iraqi security forces in all of our areas are working in partnership fully with us. In some areas, I have been able to reduce the number of coalition forces and their responsibilities there so I can go off and move my forces into other areas to create increased effects. And we're developing plans to do that right now uh, in, in one of our areas in particular. The Iraqi security forces, though, let, let me make no mistake about it. They are planning and they are employing forces across their zones in partnership with us. And there are some areas of our area of responsibility where I put limited coalition forces in on a daily basis because the Iraqis have gained control of this. Now, there is a large portion of my area, or our area northwest Baghdad, that is currently absent of any standing Iraqi police force. That is a lack of capacity. These volunteers that we're recruiting and integrating the Iraqi security forces will help us build that capacity. And then as the coalition force commanders decide that the security situation is appropriate and we have transitioned to retain with Iraqi security forces fully in the lead, then we can relocate coalition forces and Iraqi army forces to places where they're uh, needed more. So U.S. forces still con are still playing the lead role in controlling those neighborhoods, right? I mean, it's not until the retain phase that the Iraqis take control? We have, we have turned over no area specifically to the Iraqi security forces. We retain partnered responsibilities throughout the area of responsibility because I still have a responsibility as the, as the brigade combat team commander to assist the Iraqi district uh, security district commanders in increasing their capacity uh, across the zone of responsibility. And I do that by remaining plugged in with them and conducting combined uh, security coordination meetings and combined governance and essential services coordination meetings with the Iraqi security force to increase their capacity. So we are fully engaged as partners across the zone right now and are looking hard at areas uh, where we can formally turn over those area responsibilities solely to Iraqi security force control where the coalition forces would not be involved other than in the uh, transition team role. We've got time for about one more. Yeah. Louis, we'll let you take it. Sir, it's uh, Louis Martinez again with ABC. Um, you're talking about the volunteers. You mentioned Don Maria. I think I saw that uh, Maria experienced the first month without a sectarian murder or any kind of murder in about a year. Um, that is primarily a Sunni area, and I think what turned the turnaround there was primarily because the volunteers stepped forward and approached you uh, for assistance against Al Qaeda. Are you seeing the same level of um, volunteerism, if you will, on the part of the Shia in your sector? The, uh, the answer to that is almost. In the uh, Sunni areas, in places like Amaria, uh, specifically in Amaria, but also uh, reflective in places like Ghazalia and now Qadra and Jamia, which is in the uh, center uh, portion of our zone of operations, we're seeing increased organi organized uh, organization of volunteers that are working directly under the coalition forces control that came to us seeking legitimacy and integration into the Iraqi security forces. In Amaria, those volunteers came forward to us initially because they were tired of al-Qaeda and they wanted to take the, the, uh, the responsibility for removing al-Qaeda and their surrogates into their own hands. Uh, they ultimately and uh, near immediately agreed to work in partnership with us and then fall underneath our area, uh, under our responsibility as a contracted security force. In the... Uh, largely Shia areas, we have, we have begun to see increased participation with our coalition forces and Iraqi security forces across those zones. We have three areas primarily, and I'm not going to divulge them for a fear that they might fall apart on us and become targets, that have come forward and asked to organize volunteers that are focused on defeating the criminal and extremist elements that operate uh, relatively freely in pieces of this, uh, in parts of this city that we currently regard as uh, disrupt. So they are coming forward. They're not exactly like what's going on in the predominantly uh, Sunni areas, but there are large portions of the Shia population that are eager to co coordinate and cooperate with us in both the security and essential services uh, 
uh, realms to increase capacity in the, of the government of Iraq in northwest Baghdad. Quick follow-up. When you say uh, the Shia in those three areas, um, they are stepping forward. They're looking for help against the Jaysh al-Mahdi? They're, they're stepping forward because... They're, they're tired of the violence and they're tired of the criminal enterprises that are going on. There has been transitions between what Jaysh al-Mahdi was originally organized for, as I've been told in northwest Baghdad, which was to defeat al-Qaeda, and a transition to more criminally oriented extremist actors that are just out to kill people that think differently than they do. And the large moderate population in our Shia areas is tired of it. And they want, to, they want to take up arms or at least take up the opportunity to provide us increased information in an organized fashion to rid their neighborhoods of these extremists who offer no promise of reconstruction or a, uh, or a revitalization of their areas. What I have not yet seen in the uh, Shia areas is the formal coming forward of an organized group that would be representative of what we see in places like Amaria. I think time will tell. I think the conditions are set right now, and I think local leaders are looking to reach out to us now that they see a veil of protection for their efforts so that they can become more active participants in the security forces of Northwest Baghdad, be that either as policemen, uh, be that uh, national policemen, or as formal members of the uh, Iraqi army. Well, Colonel, we have reached the end of our time, and uh, before we bring it to a close, I wanted to give you uh, one more opportunity to uh, highlight or uh, uh, perhaps touch on something that we haven't here. So let me turn it back to you before we close it. Hey, I appreciate that, and I appreciate you providing me the opportunity to share a glimpse of one small piece of a, a very complex environment. As I stated earlier, the trends are positive across our area of responsibility. Violence is down, reconciliation and participation is up, and that's all good news. Grassroots and local reconciliation and revitalization, revitalization efforts are clear indications that the citizens of Baghdad have had it with senseless, senseless violence and now feel secure enough that they can actively participate with their government in security, reconstruction, and revitalization of their neighborhoods and ultimately their nation. Our ISF partners continue to improve their capabilities to control ever larger portions of the battlefield while openly working with volunteers to increase the capacity for enduring security. Our soldiers are making a tremendous difference and remain fully committed to this mission. By the way, in September, a month remaining in the fiscal year, Specialist Matthew Adams from Alpha Company, 1st Battalion, 26th Infantry, Task Force Blue Spader, became the 1,000th soldier in this brigade combat team to re-enlist. Our soldiers are committed to this mission. They want to see it through. We remain blessed to have the enduring support of our tremendous task force guardian and family readiness groups in Schweinfurt, Fort Bragg, Fort Bliss, Fort Hood, and Fort Riley, along with the continued tremendous support from the American people and other freedom-loving people from across the world. I'd ask all of you to continue to tell our soldiers and their family stories and keep them in your thoughts and prayers as we continue mission. Thanks again for your time and your attention. It's been my pleasure to tell you all a little bit about our efforts here. First team and duty first. Well, thank you, Colonel, and uh, we hope that uh, before you leave, we get one more opportunity uh, to talk to you about uh, what you're doing and your responsibilities. Thank you. He was known for his domineering personality and arm-twisting tactics of powerful politicians known as the Johnson Treatment. Discover the political and personal side of our 36th president through secretly recorded phone conversations and family films shot by home movie enthusiast Lady Bird Johnson. Presidential Libraries, History Uncovered. Two hours live from the Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library in Austin, Texas. Tonight at 8 Eastern on C-SPAN, C-SPAN Radio, on XM Satellite Radio Channel 132, and online at cspan.org. For additional videos and other archival materials on the 12 presidents covered in this series, go to our website at cspan.org slash presidential libraries. And C-SPAN 3 History brings you more about the 36th president, including memories of the Lyndon Johnson White House, shared by former press secretaries Liz Carpenter and George Christian, plus reporters who covered the Johnson administration. 
and historians, including Robert Dalek, author of several books about LBJ. This and more at 8 a.m. Eastern Time Saturday, and again Sunday night at 8, History on C-SPAN 3. Friday, the Norwegian Nobel Committee awarded its annual Peace Prize to Al Gore and a United Nations panel for their work in raising awareness on global climate change. We take you to Palo Alto, California now for reaction from the former vice president. Thank you all uh, very much. Um, I'm, of course, deeply honored to receive this award. I want to thank the uh, Nobel Committee, and it is uh, even more significant because I have the honor of sharing it with the IPCC, which is the world's preeminent scientific body focused on improving our understanding of the climate crisis. Uh, and it's made up of individuals who have tirelessly and selflessly worked on this uh, for so many years. I, uh, uh, Tipper and I will go to Oslo and I will accept this uh, award on behalf of all of those who have been working so long and so hard to try to get the message out about this planetary emergency. Uh, there have been so many thousands of people who have worked as long as I have, uh, and there have been so many activists who have been trying to sound the alarm. And um, I, Tipper and I are here because uh, we had a, a, a pre-scheduled work session at the Alliance for Climate Protection. We're going to donate 100 percent of the proceeds of this award to the Alliance for Climate Protection. Uh, it, that amount is very small compared to the enormous uh, challenge that lies ahead. And the Alliance for Climate Protection, headed by Kathy Zoe, uh, is organizing a massive grassroots movement and a mass advertising campaign, uh, all focused together on trying to change the way people think in our country and all around the world about the urgency of the climate crisis. It is the most dangerous challenge we've ever faced, but it is also the greatest opportunity that we have ever had to make changes that we should be making for other reasons anyway. This is uh, a chance to elevate global consciousness about the challenges that we face now. Just two weeks ago, there was a um, report from part of the scientific community about the accelerated melting of the North Polar ice cap. Uh, now, unbelievably, they tell us that unless we act with great urgency, the entire North Polar ice cap could be gone in less than 23 years. I could give you hundreds of other examples of how the alarm bells are going off in the scientific community and how the scientists themselves, some of whom have who have been active with the IPCC are, are, are here today. They've been trying to get the attention of the world community. For my part, I will be doing everything I can to uh, try to understand how to best use uh, the, the honor and recognition of, of this award as a way of speeding up the... Uh, uh, the, the change in awareness and the change in urgency. It, it, it truly is a planetary emergency, and, and we have to respond quickly. There's an old African proverb that says, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We have to go far quickly, and that means uh, we have to quickly find a way to change the world's consciousness about exactly what we're facing and why we have to work to solve it. I'm going back to work right now. This is just the beginning, uh, and the Alliance for Climate Protection is going to be uh, uh, charging uh, straight ahead. I want to congratulate uh, the IPCC again and again thank the Nobel Committee. Thank you all very much. This is C-SPAN, public affairs programming courtesy of America's cable companies. 
Next, the C-SPAN series Presidential Libraries History Uncovered continues. We're live at the Lyndon Johnson Presidential Library in Austin, Texas tonight. After that, remarks by retired Lieutenant General Ricardo Sanchez, who commanded coalition forces in Iraq. Then another chance to see tonight's program from the Johnson Library in Texas. Now, the C-SPAN series, Presidential Libraries, History Uncovered, at the Lyndon Johnson Presidential Library in Austin, Texas. And if I could have uh, my one wish today, it would be that uh, we would have peace in Vietnam and peace all over the world, so that uh, this little uh, granddaughter of mine and this little grandson and 550,000 uh, other families throughout this land could have uh, their daddies and their loved ones back with us. We can't always have what we wish for or what we want. We can just constantly uh, have it in our sights, work for it, and do the very best we can. Since the people... Uh, Lyndon Johnson, and selected their government. back home in Texas just hours after he left Washington following the inauguration of his successor, Richard Nixon. This footage you're seeing now, and we'll be featuring throughout the next two hours, was shot by U.S. Navy film crews, which Lyndon Johnson allowed unprecedented access to the behind-the-scenes activities of his administration. LBJ also documented his presidency by secretly tapping hundreds of hours of his phone calls. And tonight we'll play for you some that were just released this last Tuesday to the public and we'll be airing them for the first time. On your screen is a live picture of one of LBJ's phones that he would have used during those conversations located inside the Oval Office exhibit at his library in Austin, Texas where we'll be taking you throughout the rest of the evening. But first, joining us in our Washington studios is our historian for...